Hello, everyone, and welcome to your linear algebra review on the properties of vector spaces. My name is Jason, and I work for the ASU Tutoring Centers. Now, there are 10 properties of vector spaces that sort of define it as being a vector space. I mentioned this in the previous video, but um, a vector set, a vector set is a collection of vectors in addition to um, some additive uh, property and some scalar multiplicative property. So you have a, a collection of vectors, you have some way to add those vectors, and you have some way to scalar multiply those vectors. That's a vector set. Now, if you want to make a vector space, you need to have a vector set, and you also need to include these sort of 10 additional properties. Okay, so a vector set might satisfy a couple of the vector properties, but if you want to be a, a full on vector space, you have to satisfy all, all 10 of the vector properties. Okay, uh, I have on the next slide what all the properties are. But let's first just verify that this, that this example we have here is a vector set. So it's a collection of vectors, which it is, because they told me it's R3. So it's, a, it's the collection of all three dimensional vectors with real number coefficients. So the vector 2a7 over pi and negative square root of e. This one is in v because v is r3. And r3 is just all three dimensional vectors where each component is a real number. And every single one of these is in fact a real number. Okay, so I have a collection of vectors all three dimensional vectors with, with real number coefficients. Do I have some sort of addition? I do. Do I have some sort of scalar multiplication? I do. So the example we have here is in fact a vector set. So then to show whether or not it is a vector space, we need to verify all 10 vector space properties. Um, I'm gonna show you all of them on the next slide. It's a lot, so get ready. Oh my gosh, I warned you, I warned you it's a lot. So these are all 10 of the properties that you need to officially be called a vector space. These first ones are called the, the vector space axioms. And these last two are called your closure properties. You need all 10 of these though, in order to be considered a vector space. Um, so I'm just kind of going to briefly go through each of them. The first one's commutivity of your addition. And what this means is that the order you add your vectors in shouldn't matter. So whether I do u plus v or v plus u, I should get the same answer. Okay, the order you do it in should not matter. The next one, associativity of addition. So this means essentially you can move around parentheses. Okay. So doing u plus v and then plus w should be the same as doing v plus w. So you do the, the right portion first, and then you do the you add the u in there. So basically, the order that you add in shouldn't matter. Whether you add the first two and then the third, or the last two and then the first, should be the same. That's associativity. Uh, next ones we have the additive identity and additive inverse properties. We talked about those in the previous video, but what those mean is that additive identity means you have some unique zero vector that satisfies this property. So there's some vector in your vector space, in your vector set, I should say, it's not a space yet. There's some vector in your vector set such that when you add it to any other vector, you get that vector back. Okay? That's, and we call that the zero vector, even though it might not just be zero, zero, zero. It could be something else, as we saw in the last video. Then you have the additive inverse property, which says that for any vector you have u, there exists some other vector, negative u is what we usually call it, such that when you add them together, you get the zero vector out of it. So in order to have an additive inverse, you first and foremost need an additive identity. Next one's associativity of scalar multiplication. So just as we had associativity of uh, vector addition, we have associativity of scalar multiplication. So this is saying, if I multiply my two uh, scalars together using just like normal multiplication, right? Like two times three is six, that kind of multiplication and then I do the scalar multiplication, that's the same as doing the scalar multiplication in two steps, right? Because here, if I do this scalar beta times u, 
I would get another vector, and then I take that vector and scalar multiply by alpha again. So again, saying the order that you do it in shouldn't matter. Next is distributivity of, of scalar multiplication with respect to a sum of scalars. So if you're adding two scalars together and you're scalar multiplying by a vector, you can sort of distribute this. So you can do alpha scalar multiplied with u, beta scalar multiplied with u, and then those two vectors that you get, you're going to add them together with your additive property. Um, and then you also have distribu distrib distributivity of scalar multiplication with respect to addition. So in this, in this case, in A6, it's you're adding scalars together and multiplying by a vector. In this case, you're adding vectors to get together and multiplying by a single scalar. But you can do the same property here, right? You can distribute this alpha to both of the vectors and then add those together. That's what that's saying. Uh, last one is a scalar identity. So just as we had an additive identity, right, some zero vector out there, we should also have some sort of scalar identity, which we denote by the symbol one. So it's some vector, again, it's just a vector, or sorry, not, it's a scalar, that when I scalar multiply by any vector, I get the original vector out of it. Okay, we usually use one because in the standard scalar multiplication, one times any vector when we use the standard scalar multiplication is just that original vector. That's why we use the symbol of one. But again, it might not be the actual number one. It might be something else depending on how the scalar multiplication is defined. And the last two properties are closure properties. So you have to be closed under addition, which means if I take any two vectors in my vector space and add them together, I have to remain in my vector space. So adding arbitrary vectors together should not push me out of my vector space, right? Adding a three-dimensional vector plus another three-dimensional vector should not give me something four-dimensional. Uh, and then you should also be closed under scalar multiplication, which a similar property, any arbitrary vector and any arbitrary scalar I have, um, if I multiply the vector by that scalar, I should still stay within my vector space. So taking a three-dimensional vector and multiplying it by a scalar to give me a four-dimensional vector is not allowed. Whew, that's a lot. So if you want to verify that a vector set is in fact a vector space, you would have to go through every single one of these and verify that every single one of these properties holds. It's a lot of work. Okay, so let's go through our previous one and see what we have. So let me just push that and go back. There we go. Um, okay, so let's verify if this is a vector space or not. So let's start with our first property. Our first property was commutivity. Commutivity. T I V I T Y of plus, which means the order that you add vectors in shouldn't matter. So taking an arbitrary vector X plus a vector y should give me y plus a vector x. Now, how do you show that this is true? Well, in order to prove that this is true, you have to use arbitrary vectors. So you'd have to take like vector x to be something arbitrary, x1, x2, and x3, and vector y to be something arbitrary, y1, y2, and y3, and then do a bunch of fancy math starting over here on the left-hand side, and showing that it equals the right-hand side. That's what you would have to do. Okay, you can't use specific vectors. So I couldn't take x to be like 17, 82, 94, and y to be uh, negative three, zero, negative two, and then show that it works for those. That's not allowed. If you wanna prove that something works, you have to prove it works for any arbitrary vector. Because then that means it works for literally any vectors you choose. Now, if you want to prove that something fails, you just have to show that it fails for particular vectors you choose. So if I'm trying to show that this property fails, then what I can do is take two specific vectors, like this one and that one, and add them together in two different ways. So doing x plus y and y plus x, and show that those don't equal each other. If this property fails 
for any two specific vectors, then the property fails overall. This property has to work for every single vector. So if you can find a single counterexample, two vectors that when added in, in different orders change, um, then you're done. You've shown that it failed commutivity. So typically when I'm trying to prove these 10 properties, if I'm ever trying to prove these 10 properties, what I would do is I would just come up with a couple examples, a couple like easier examples, not 17, 82, 94, a couple easier examples and just test it out. Test it out with a couple specific ones to see if it works. If it seems to work every single time, then I'll say, okay, this is probably true. Let me prove it for arbitrary vectors, right? Using symbols. Um, but if, if I test it out and it fails even one of my cases, then I'm already done. Then I've already shown that it's not commutative. Okay? So if I'm trying to show commutivity here, I'm going to take two specific vectors just, just to try it out again. Again, this would not prove anything if it worked. It's more so just trying it out um, to see if, if it works for at least a couple vectors of my choosing. So let me take x to be a vector 1, 2, 3, and y to be the vector 4, 5, 6. You know, why not? So if I'm doing x plus y, so I'm doing 1, 2, 3, plus 4, 5, 6. Let's see how my vector addition is defined. It's defined to be this. I take the first component of x and I add it to the last component of y. So this would be 1 plus 6. And then my middle term, I take the middle two terms and add them together. So that's normal. I just do 2 plus 5. And then for my last one, I take the last term of x and the first term of y. So I'm basically, I'm doing like a little crisscross. I'm adding in this way. So I'm doing three plus four here. So I get, oh, that's cool. I get seven, seven, seven. Well, that's neat. Now let me do it the other way around. Let me do y plus x. So I'm doing four, five, six plus one, two, three. So the same concept, right? I take the first term here and I add it to the last term here. And then I add my middle two terms together. So I go five plus two. And then I add my, my last term here with my first term here. So I do six plus one and I get, ooh, seven, seven, seven. Okay, this is looking good, right? After doing just a single example, I'm thinking, oh, this might actually work. But again, Doing a single example is not enough. Okay? You, have to, um, you have to show, if you think it does truly work, you have to show it works for any arbitrary examples you choose. So let me maybe do another example. Let me do another example just to, just, just to get it in my head that yes, this is true. Again, I only did one example. Let me at least try a second one. Let's see what happens. Right? What if I take something like, like one, um, two, uh, four, and I add to it um, three, uh, seven, and, and 10. Maybe try that, you know? Let's get a little wackier. So let's see what X plus Y would be. One, two, four, plus three, seven, 10. So that would be one plus 10 it would be two plus seven and it would be four plus three. So I get 11, nine, seven. Now what if I do it the other way around? Three, seven, 10 plus one, two, four. So that's going to be um, three plus four. It's going to be seven plus two and it's going to be 10 plus one. So that gives me seven, nine and 11. Wait a minute, these two vectors are different. So it failed this time. Right? So even though I did a single example and it worked, that didn't mean that my, my, my vector addition property is commutative. Because again, that was one example. Here I tried a different example and it failed. Okay? So because this property doesn't hold for every single vector, it automatically fails. So this property, this property fails. 
And because this property fails, uh, this cannot be a vector space. To be a vector space, every single property has to be true. So as long as you show that it failed for a single property, you automatically know that this is not a vector space. We don't even have to check any other properties. We don't have to check uh, associativity. We don't have to check the closure properties, nothing else. We all automatically know it's not a vector space. So we're done. That's how you do it. Okay. So these can be very, very tricky. Again, my, my suggestion is to try a couple examples out. If it seems to work every single time for those examples, then it might be true. At which point you have to prove it for arbitrary vectors. Right, you take an arbitrary x1, x2, x3, an arbitrary y1, y2, y3, add them together, try to rearrange some stuff and see if you can get you know, the, the reverse in the, in the case of commutivity. Right, taking x plus y, do a little bit of math, show that that equals y plus x. Okay? But I always start with just a couple examples because it's, it's good to just get an idea of what's going on, right? Cool, 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 cool. All right, um, let me go ahead and clear this. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I work for the ASU Tutoring Centers. So if you want more information about the free tutoring resources we have on all four major ASU campuses and online, please go ahead and check out tutoring.asu.edu. If you want more uh, videos like this that go over specific concepts for your course, or maybe you want to see what upcoming review sessions we have for the exams in your course, go ahead and check out that link below. Again, thank you all for, for uh, watching this, and I hope you have an amazing day.